Kachin, I'm the zoo manager, and we do a winter lecture series about conservation from uh, November through this year through April. Hi, I'm Chris Bignani. Um, I'm an ecologist at the Institute for Wildlife Studies, and I'm also a member of the Conservation Advisory Committee. So before we get to our talk about porcupines, I wanted to spend a few minutes to tell you about another species that lives in the same Calvary Dunes area. This is the Oregon silver spot butterfly. It's a fritillary butterfly that's named for these beautiful silvery spots on the undersides of its wings. Sure. Um, it's a federally threatened species that's been extirpated for, from most of its range. So the um, the little black stars are where it used to be, and the red triangles are where it's, it's left now. So the southernmost and one of the healthiest populations is found in Delaware County near Lake Earl. Um, next slide. And this is its habitat. It lives in open coastal prairies and dune swales. Next slide. Um, this habitat is being threatened not only by urban development, but by encroachment from woody plants like pines and scotch broom. Next slide. So a couple years ago, Sequoia Park Zoo partnered with the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Tallawa Dune Stores to organize a work day at Lake Earl to remove scotch broom from some of the potential Oregon silver spot habitat. This is a family-friendly event, and if you like bashing invasive species, this is highly satisfying. <laughs> Next slide. So last year, our enthusiastic crew was able to clear a meadow like this in about two hours. And by the end of the day, we had removed scotch broom from over five acres of potential wow. Oregon silver spot habitat and fill the 40 cubic yard dumpster. <laughs> All right. um, next slide. And then a couple of months later, some of us went back and we were able to see the butterfly's post plant, which is this early blue violet coming up in some of the sites that we had worked up. So this is a great event and it's a great opportunity to help a beautiful rare butterfly species. Next slide. Um, so if any of you are interested in joining us for the third annual Scotch Broom Bash, it's going to be held on March 19th, and I'm organizing carpools. So if you're interested, please put your contact information on the sign-up sheet, and I'll get in touch with you. Thanks. And I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speakers, um, because I know them well. Dr. Tim <coughs> Bean arrived here, I, know, I should know my dates better, about three years ago to teach for us in the Department of Wildlife and uh, he came as a lecturer straight out of his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He did some, and working, which I keep talking, he's <laughs> He did some really <laughs> fascinating work on uh, the ecology of kangaroo rats um, here, sort of in Northern California, south of here a little bit. Um, and a few years after he arrived, we, um, had a new position open up in the department and we snatched him up and hired him. He's a full-time uh, tenure track faculty member in the department. And what we like so much about Tim Bean is that he uses, he thinks outside the box and he uses new technologies to solve problems in wildlife management and conservation. So he's always sort of at the cutting edge of, of new technologies. He used satellite images in his PhD to look at um, burrows of kangaroo rats. And so that was really amazing. And uh, he's really added to the department in helping students get through their spatial analyses and doing GIS work. And, um, and I could go on and on, but um, you should uh, check out some of his work. And what's fun, when he got here, um, the rodent guy uh, thought he would take on the largest rodent in North America and uh, do some work on the slucky pine in North America. <laughs> I should know that. I said, okay. So, um, and uh, it's really interesting. They'll talk to you about the history of the porcupine in California, but not a lot really is known about them. Their populations seem to be declining. So he um, started the project, and I'm not going to steal his thunder. <laughs> That's 
that's my child. <laughs> okay. Um, so, without further ado, um, Tim B. and he brought his graduate student, or along with Tim, is Kara Apple, who started her graduate work here at Humboldt State last year on this porcupine project, and they've been doing some really neat stuff that they're going to tell you about today. Thanks. Thank you. For coming. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience, and um, there are a few videos that we're going to try to show later in the talk, but uh, may not come to pass. They are on YouTube, so I can send the link out or something if it doesn't work out. But um, thank you for your patience, and thank you so much for coming out. It's so nice to see so many people interested in porcupines um, on the North Coast. And uh, yeah, Kara's here because she has done all the work. Um, so she will tell you all about the really interesting stuff that um, she's been finding um, out in the Tallow Dunes. And uh, we'll show you some pictures from the Tallow Dunes, but I just want to reiterate it. It's an incredible place. Um, how many people have been up to the Tallow Dunes State Park? Great. So I feel like if they get short shrift around here because you can just go out to Moel or Lanphier and think that you get the coastal dune forest experience. Uh, but it's really different out there. It's a really unique place, um, maybe the last like it in California. So if you haven't been, go. If you have, go again. Um, and you might see a porcupine. <laughs> so I will tell you a little bit about porcupine distribution in general, and this is a question that we get a lot, which is what happened to all the porcupines that used to be around Humboldt County? Um, and to try to start to answer that and introduce some of the work that we're doing in the dunes, I'll tell you a little bit about porcupine natural history, although it sounds like you've got pretty much all you need to know uh, already with Dorsey, and then um, Kara will come up and tell you about what she's been doing uh, since June of last year. So, these are porcupines. How many people have seen a porcupine in the wild? Half, half. So that's a lot, that's a lot of people. How about um, in coastal Northern California? So like Mendocino, Del Norte, Humboldt County, okay, so the hands are dropping a little bit. And how about in the past five years, how many people have seen a wild porcupine? And did you report it to porcupinder.com? <laughs> yes, thank you. If not, when you get home tonight, um, we really would love to have those sightings. I'll show you more about that in a minute. It seems like that's a pretty common story these days, is that um, people used to see porcupines in this area, and they don't see them as much anymore. Whether live or roadkill, which is the, probably the most common way that people see porcupines. And interestingly, so this is um, porcupine distribution from amazingly northern Mexico, incredibly dry, hot climates, right, desert, desert southwest, up to my home state of Massachusetts, all the way up into like Timberline and Alaska, and then down into our wonderful state of California. California is kind of an enigma. We don't actually really know where they are in California, or where they were in California, or where they were supposed to be in California. This is four different um, range maps for porcupines in the state. Uh, 2004, 2003, 67, and 95, and um, what you'll see is there's a huge discrepancy in where people think California uh, porcupines are in the state. Right? This one map says, oh, there should be throughout the Central Valley. Right? A lot of them are suggesting sort of um, distri distributed around up in these mountainous areas, higher elevations. Is it just one of these maps that says they're native here, or two of them? Okay, so that. California Wildlife Habitat Relationships Database. This is from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then this other one says that they're, they might be native here, um, and the other type two say no. So we aren't really even sure if they're supposed to be here. And in fact, the only study that I am aware of of porcupines in northern coastal California um, is this study by, done by this guy, Yoakum, who was a professor in the wildlife department. And in 1971, he had collected all of these um, sightings. And this was sort of an early porcupinder.com study. Um, Yoakum just went around and talked to people who had been living in Humboldt County and Del Mar County for a while, and collected kind of the earliest known records of uh, settlers, right, white people settling in these areas, um, noticing porcupines. And his conclusion 
was that they weren't natives, that they immigrated in from either Oregon um, or from inland California, and that it was really with, this is, can anybody read this, lumber production. Okay. So as lumber, Yoakum's argument was that as we were uh, cutting down all of these very large trees, we were opening up habitat and providing new places for porcupines to come in and feed, providing new food sources for porcupines. And he suggested it was this incredible, of course, boom. Everybody knows this. Huge boom in lumber production mid-20th century. To the point where he reports seeing porcupines on Humboldt State's campus mm -hmm. in the 50s and 70s. I've seen people nodding their heads. It's amazing. Um, he suggested that as we move away from um, clear-cutting practices, let a lot of those um, clear cuts grow back up into second growth, that we might actually expect to see porcupines decline. So as far as Yoakum is concerned, it's, all, it's just natural that porcupines may have been more common 20, 30 years ago, and now they're not anymore because there's not as much food available for them. I don't really buy that. I don't know if Kara buys that either. I think we're still trying to work that out. But we decided first, let's try to get a good idea of where they are now. So with very generous funding from the Sequoia Park Zoo, um, we started this website, porcupinder.com, printed a bunch of flyers, put them up in all of the places we could think of, from vets to um, sporting goods stores and grocery stores and things like that. Uh, and please, if you do see a porcupine or have seen a porcupine in the past, we're just trying to get general information about where they're found in this area. And so far, we've had over 80 responses. Uh, this is the general map. We also get people sending us photographs of porcupines, which is wonderful. It's like the best emails that I get every day. People sending me photos from the field. This guy has incredible long guard hair on his head. But you can see somewhat of a pattern. There are really two hot spots. And the first one is down in this area, down in the Bear River Ridge area. There are rumored to be porcupines down there. Um, I've gone out a bunch of times trying to find them, but have not seen any. But they do seem to be down there in maybe low numbers. Overwhelmingly, the porcupine sightings that we get are up in Crescent City, and specifically, Tallawa Dune State Park. So this is sort of where we were at about two years ago when Kara started thinking about doing her master's work here and thinking about what kinds of research she might want to do. This notion that porcupines are declining, we have some general idea of where they are now, but we really don't know why they might be declining um, or really where to start. And so what we first did was try to think carefully about porcupine natural history and um, what might be affecting them on the coast that's not affecting them elsewhere. So I'll just walk you through that to give you a sense of how porcupines generally perform in other areas. And the four things I'll, I'll introduce, there's plenty of other things to talk about, but these are the four that we think are really important. Diet, and part of their diet leads to this really strong drive and need for sodium. So if people have had problems with porcupines, this is an issue in a lot of other areas where um, people's cabins and, and fuel lines and things get gnawed on. Anything with salt on it basically gets maybe subject to porcupine damage. Um, reproduction and predation. These are kind of the four things that come up somewhat frequently when we start talking about why porcupines might be declining. Okay. So porcupines have kind of this unique approach to life, uh, at least unique in North America. They're herbivores. Um, and they get, you know, all of their food is plant material. Plant material is not that uh, uh, nutritious. They don't get a ton of energy from it. And so consequently, they're pretty slow. They're not good at avoiding predation. And so naturally, you might expect, right, they've evolved these incredible quills. Here is this, um, zoomed into the very tip of this quill. You can see not only is it sharp, but it's also got these backward facing bars that the minute it gets pushed in, it's very hard to pull out, right? It's an incredible defense mechanism that lets porcupines be kind of slow and not very energetic. They're kind of like the sloths 
of North America, right? They're not going to run away from a predator, right? They're going to either use these quills to defend themselves or these incredibly um, strong claws that they use for climbing. And maybe some of you can see these, the um, actual pad has, has these nice bumps on it that also helps them to climb. I'll try it. <laughs> But uh, you saw Dorsey, right? I mean, these are not the most agile, fast animals. They're pretty awkward. They don't move very well. They're easy to wrangle, which will come back up when we start talking about the GPS data that we're working with. The second issue that porcupines have learned or evolved to deal with well is this problem of tannic acid and other plant defensive compounds. So plants. Um, as you might expect, have evolved all of these mechanisms to prevent herbivory. Right? Plants don't like it when animals come and eat their leaves, and so tannic acid is a pretty common um, secondary compound that is poisonous to a lot of animals. Porcupines seem particularly good at processing tannic acids, and so here's a picture of a small shore pine out in Tolowa Dunes and right up here, you can see it's been completely stripped of its bark and it's sort of scraping the inner bark for food. And that kills the short run. Are the porcupines in redwoods? Or were they ever? We don't know. I think that one of the issues with the redwoods is that if they get too big and wide around, then they may be hard for them to climb. Huh. Um, but state parks did have some cameras up. I think a couple of years ago, um, looking for fishers and martins and carnivore surveys down in uh, Humboldt Redwoods State Park and got a porcupine on their camera. Nice. That's all that we know about that. So kind of intriguing, but um, they don't seem to show up in red reports that much. Okay, this is this is something that they can do, but it's probably not the majority of their diet. Okay, but we do see it somewhat regularly out in the dunes. These um, Young shore pines, usually out in the open, it's usually not ones that are kind of clumped in with a bunch of other pines, but they're out in the open and they've been stripped enough that they've started to die. And here's sort of a fresh um, looking one, and here's one that has um, that evidence of porcupine feeding from many years ago. Is that the So this is what they're eating, right? They eat leaves, they eat bark. Um, they seem to be able to survive on bark in most places in the winter when there's not a lot of green leafy vegetation available to them. They'll rely on these bark resources to get it through. But it's not particularly nutritious. And even porcupines may be poisoned by those tannic acids eventually. So why do we eat leafy greens? What's so great about kale? And what's the nutrient that we're looking for? High end. I heard that. Potassium. Potassium. It's up there. Right? <laughs> Kale and all of these leafy greens are super high in potassium, which is great for us, but not great for herbivores. Right? And anybody who has cows or horses knows that it's important to provide sodium sources to herbivores that are overloading on potassium. Okay, there's this complicated, this is just straight out of an like intro bio textbook, right? There's this complicated mechanism where animals need to balance sodium ions with potassium ions. It's really important for nerve function and a bunch of other things that I won't get too much into. But this is a big issue for porcupines, where they'll overload on potassium and then have to find some natural source of sodium. Or, in you know, the past few hundred years, try to seek out some human sources of sodium. This is um, a young juvenile porcupine uh, out in the Yon Tocket Slough in Tolowa Dune State Park that we think gets um, some marine influence and gets salt water sometimes in the winter. And so a lot of these plants we think are covered in sodium. In fact, I will give away part of Kara's talk. We saw a lot of porcupines out in this area last summer. Is this your photo, Kara? I don't know. It's yours. Here's uh, one of our field assistants is also out here, but this is a little piece of dirt that this young porcupine has in its paws that it seems to be consuming. We think that's sodium drive. And this is really seasonal too. So this is from um, upstate New York and the Catskills, 2004, 5, 6, and 7. Um, this guy, oldest rose, the like um, 
Jane Goodall, the porcupine researchers, <laughs> presented an incredible book called The North American Porcupine. I can't recommend it enough, but here's one figure showing. Right in the springtime, there's this strong sodium drive, and then it kind of disappears, and then it shows back up the next spring. And so it's a seasonal problem. That That's the second thing. The third thing is porcupines are really slow to reproduce. They're not your typical rodent species that's having a lot of litter multiple times a year with lots of um, young per litter. Uh, porcupines have one offspring per year. Females spend 11 out of the 12 months either pregnant or lactating. And they reproduce every year. But they're slow to reproduce, right? They're not getting a lot of energy from their diet. Um, they don't have a lot of energy to put towards raising young. Here's two. Here's a male and female porcupine last November. Um, and when they show up together like this, eventually you get this. And uh, in general, this is tied, I mean, for most of this data, right, is again from the Catskills, and it's tied to winter and summer seasons, like you would expect across most of North America. Reproduction happens in the fall, just like these guys. And then uh, babies are born in late spring, like April, May, sometimes into June. And this figure is showing distance that uh, mother and baby pair are from each other. That Rose was finding them, uh, um, watching them forage. And you see for a couple months, there's basically zero meter distance between the mother and the baby. And starting in August and September, um, the baby will disperse a little bit, maybe wander a couple hundred yards or meters away, and then return to its mother. But by October, it's pretty much independent. And so that's kind of the third thing to keep in mind, is there's this really strong seasonal component that porcupines deal with um, that in most places is tied to winter when there's not a lot of food and it's cold and they're losing fat reserves and then springtime comes and they're all ready to reproduce. Which doesn't sound like coastal Northern California, right? Okay, the final thing that I'll mention about porcupine natural history is predation. This comes up a lot. What on earth could possibly eat a porcupine? Fisher eat porcupines, mountain lions eat porcupines, um, what was this, Fisher also? So those are the two big ones, Fisher and mountain lions. But it's not instinctive. It doesn't seem like it's an instinctive thing that all fishers and all mountain lions know how to capture and kill and consume a porcupine. It's a learned behavior. Either they discover it on their own or um, it's passed on from parent to child. It's a complicated process. You flip a porcupine over and then um, kill it from the underside. I've heard anecdotally that coyotes can also figure out how to do that, um, but we have certainly not observed that. All right, so now I'm going to take what Tim was talking about, about how we're thinking about porcupine ecology, and I'm going to explain some of the ways that we've been trying to figure out how it's similar or different in northern California, specifically in the Talo Dunes. So uh, I'll briefly introduce our project. I will share some preliminary results and then also just some observations from the nine or so months of field work that we've been doing so far. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, I know you've seen a couple maps by now, but um, this is the Tallaby Dunes area. Again, it's between Crescent City and the Oregon border, right on the ocean. There's a lot of public land in coastal Del Mar County, so Lake, the Lake Earl Wildlife Area is adjacent. Lake Earl is a big estuary and lagoon, and then the state park extends all the way from down by the Crescent City Airport up to the mouth of the Smith River. So my study site is restricted um, just to this northern portion uh, towards the Smith River, and this is about eight square, eight and a half square kilometers in area. So this is where I'll be talking about. And to convince you further how beautiful this site is, um, just want to share some photos. Uh, we, we talk about it as a dune, but it really has a variety of different habitats and vegetation types. So, you know, the classic dune looks like this out there. There is there is some European beach grass, but there's also um, quite a bit of native dune habitat, some of the only remaining in the state. 
uh, kind of typified by these shrubby shore pines, wax myrtle bushes, coyote brush, um, co tall conifer forests as well, Sitka spruce, um, with sort of this typical understory. Beautiful meadows with herds of elk, uh, freshwater ponds that are pretty unique um, and very rare anymore in <coughs> dunes in California. Uh, they even support western pond turtles, and these change quite a bit seasonally, at least in the drought year. It looks completely different in the, um, in the summer as it does now. And then willow thickets, we got to know very intimately over the summer. Uh, so there are a lot of riparian kind of marshy areas up there as well. And in addition to porcupines, <coughs> that supports a great diversity of other wildlife. Elk have returned recently to the park, deer, um, mammals, and a lot of interesting amphibians, as well as birds, uh, including some not as common as these that I just need so uh, since the very end of May, uh, we've been capturing and radio collaring for people. Capture process uh, is shown by this picture of Tim here. This is actually really easy for you find. It's not quite that easy to capture them. But the thick welding gloves and the trash can are our, our best pieces of equipment that we use. So we captured porcupines. We're attaching radio transmitters to them, which look like this. So this is about a 20 gram piece of equipment that emits a radio signal. And it doesn't actually record any data, so this requires a lot of manpower and time to go out and you know, find the porcupines using the radio receiver and record the locations. So that's the majority of our data. We're also trying some experimental GPS trackers, which I have. So passing this around. So this is a small device. Um, it's actually available just for consumers to track, you know, if you go hiking, you can track your route or put it in your car. Um, and we're trying that in contrast to the commercially available wildlife GPS collars, which are extremely expensive. Um, you know, the limitations are the technology, so battery life and weight. Um, it's okay to put on an animal. So these are about 60 to up to $100. And so we're trying to figure out if we can you know, play around with the settings and the attachment methods and come up with a feasible technology that can be used to gather data on, on wildlife. And I'll talk a little bit more about our data that we've got from that later. And then finally, I'll uh, briefly introduce uh, some SCAD analysis that um, Paris Sutter, uh assistant has done to try to figure out what porcupines are doing. So I just wanted to share some pictures of the process. So once we capture a porcupine, uh, we do anesthetize them to attach the, the transmitter, both for their safety and for ours. So this is uh, one of our females that we are processing out in the field, um, just some of the hazards of Handling porcupines, even when they're anesthetized, you can get stuck with quills. Oh. You try to pick up a porcupine. Uh, this is actually the, the radio collar. You can see parted between the quills. Um, and the transmitter is just a small device under, underneath the chin. Uh, we do get a chance to see these animals pretty closely, which is really neat. Um, uh, you know, if you were able to see Dorsey up close, you could see her orange incisors. So this is typical of rodents. And, uh, they continue growing throughout the animal's lifetime, and that orange enamel, enamel keeps them strong for you know, chewing bark and things like that. I'm always fascinated by how densely packed the fields are. It's always nice to see um, in person. So we were very successful. We captured and radio colored 16 porcupines, uh, 10 males and 6 females. And once we have the collars on, like I mentioned, these are just radio transmitters, so we have to go out um, and track down the animals. So we spent all summer wandering around the dunes uh, with antennas, tracking down all of our porcupines. Um, I had amazing help from um, several students. And these are our results. If the video will play. I've tried so many ways to display this visually. Um, and then a couple days ago, Tim came up with this amazing video. Basically, it's like my entire thesis in a minute and a half. So this is showing all of the relocations, the visual relocations. So each time we saw one of our colored porcupines um, all summer. And each color is a different animal. So when a new color pops up, that means, oh, we just colored a new porcupine here. And now um, each time, you know, they pop up on the screen, that's a day. So you know, this day, we only got one. This day, a few are showing up now. So it's really neat to watch, I think we're into the middle of July now, uh, just watch through the summer where the porcupines were and you can sort of see the points accumulating into what will eventually become their home ranges and analysis. 
So a few interesting things to point out here. Um, this one animal seems to be traveling up the peninsula towards where he can spend most of the, the summer on an island in the Smith River. Uh, another interesting thing is just the amount of overlap in these points. Um, you know, a thing in the literature that we found a lot is that porcupines don't overlap a lot in their home ranges, particularly the females don't overlap. And if you look at these, um, actually only this black one here is a male. The rest of these in this northern area are all females. So there's a very high amount of overlap in what we're seeing in their home ranges, which is really interesting. Um, again, these just represent the animals that we have radio collars on, and so we can go out and find. There are, you know, of course, a lot of other animals out there that we saw in addition. So we're into February now. Um, if you've been, I think it's about, I think we stopped. So if you can see at the end there, um, there's sort of a pattern in the points shifting out towards the dunes, and I'll show that a little bit in a little bit more detail. But basically, that, is, that was our summer <laughs> and fall. So this is, to summarize, you know, we got over 500 locations of these 16 animals. And um, in addition to that, we had 95 sightings of uncollared porcupines. That's not 95 individual animals, but, you know, when you're out there tracking through the dunes, you come across porcupines a lot. Alright, uh, so I'm not showing the actual analysis that went from those points to calculating our home ranges, um, but basically we calculated their average summer home range was about 22 hectares, um, which falls about average in what the literature says. And we're still, you know, collecting data from the winter and we'll see whether that, whether that changes and how that changes, but uh, that's what we found so far. We were also interested to see how the seasonality affects their, um, them physiologically. So, you know, Tim talked a lot about the diet changes seasonally and the habitat use changes. And so, in the literature, um, you know, in areas with really harsh winters where they're even, they're switching their diet pretty drastically, porcupines lose a lot of their weight in the winter time when they're persisting on you know bark and needles, which are very low quality foods. And so we're curious to see whether a, a similar pattern shows up here on the coast with totally different seasonality. So we weighed all of our animals that I captured, and then again in the fall and periodically, you know, sometimes when we were to capture them, took the GPS trackers on, for example, we weigh them. And what was really interesting was even in uh, you know late summer, early fall, when we started capturing them, they were already really they were already losing weight um, pretty significantly. And that's continued into the, the winter, um, which might be expected. But it's interesting because the summer is really when porcupines need to put on weight, uh, you know, in areas where the winters are very harsh. Without the, you know, without that ability to maintain body weight in the summer, they're going to have a really hard time in the winter. So the fact that that isn't really consistent with the literature is really interesting, you know, showing that maybe they are responding to the different seasonality here on the coast where. Uh, summer might actually be really hard for them, at least the late summer where everything's dried up, um, the rains haven't really started yet, and um, it's just a, a very different climate. And we're also thinking about this in terms of the reproductive cycle. So, you know, Tim mentioned the young are usually born in the spring or early summer, and that really uh, importantly coincides with the availability of nutrition. So, that, you know, the mothers need to have access to food when they're nursing, and we, you know, we're trying to figure out when the reproductive cycle happens here. I still see, you know, pretty small young porcupines out um, in the in the fall and winter, and so we're wondering if there might be some sort of disconnect between the availability of food and the reproductive cycle here, or if it's not that tradition, you know, the what you would expect to see other places, um, it might actually be affecting their reproduction. So some of my habitat selection results um, and observations. So in the summertime, you know, this is pretty typical habitat for a porcupine. There's actually a porcupine in that picture. Um, and you can't see it here, and I probably couldn't see it when I was 20 feet away taking this picture. Um, this is a really thick kind of willow, marshy area. Uh, here he is, zoomed in. Um, so we really found them in, you know, eating deciduous leaves, basically. And willows are the most common of the deciduous leaves out there. This is another common way that we saw porcupines was high up a willow tree. They can climb pretty high. You've seen this picture, so this is again in the um, Yontocket Slough, which is a brackish 
area connected to the Smith River is mostly dry all summer. It's distinctly not dry right now. Uh, and then, so herbaceous swales, this includes, you know, sedges and kind of wetter areas, um, grasses. So this is a uh, form that porcupine is in, actually, um, in kind of a sedgy area, sedge area. So that's what we saw all summer, kind of in the willows and the, uh, the wetter areas. In the fall and winter, uh, it really started to change. So the will, you know, the willows lost their leaves by about November, and there really wasn't any food in those areas for porcupines anymore. And so we started seeing them grazing, which is really interesting. It also means it's a really good time to go up and try to see a porcupine. Um, I often would see them before I would even get out of the truck when I drive up to the gate. So this is uh, right next to the Ontucket Cemetery. This is a porcupine grazing in the grass. Um, they've also shifted more to out towards the dunes and towards the conifer areas. So this is a porcupine perched at the top of a little shore pine. Uh, this is actually that same porcupine eating a wax myrtle. So wax myrtle is an evergreen shrub, so it's all leaves in the fall and winter out in the dunes. So we've definitely noticed the seasonal changes. No. <laughs> the coolest video. But this video is on YouTube, right? Yes. Yeah. So in order to, to kind of further understand the um, microhabitat use of these porcupines, we're experimenting with the GPS trackers. Is that still going around somewhere? Got it. So these GPS trackers have a battery life of a couple weeks. And that means you know we have to keep going out there and switching them out. Porcupines are a pretty ideal species to test this on. You know, it's not something that's as wide ranging as a, a wolf or something that's hard to recapture. So we have an animation of GPS locations that we obtained from a porcupine. We had uh, a GPS tracker on a female for four different periods throughout the summer and fall. If you go on YouTube, you can see these points animate. Um, you know, basically every 10 minutes we took a point for each, you know, about two week period we had it on her. And you can follow her route throughout the dunes. Um, it's really interesting to see how it changes from summer to winter. This was really uh, important to us because we learned about some areas they were using that we wouldn't have known they were using without the GPS tracker. So, you know, in the amount of time we could get thousands of GPS points, we could only get out there maybe, you know, once every couple days to actually find her. And so we found she was using an apple tree that we hadn't known about. Um, we found she was using a patch with a den, or we found another porcupine, but we didn't know she was using that patch. Um, so it, it's given us some really interesting and promising results. That's something we're continuing to work on. This is still from the beginning of the video, and we'll continue. Uh, this is, again, an overview of what that data looked like. So um, the red are the telemetry points, and the gray are all the GPS points. So you know, if we had only had the telemetry points, we would have missed a lot of information about this. Um, so moving on to the diet analysis. Uh, again, this was work that Parasa did and is still doing. This is the summer work. Uh, so we collected scats, these were porcupine scats, from uh, known individuals, so from our collared animals, so that we could compare across animals and also in the entire population, or uh, the population of our collared animals. And Parasa was able to um, you know, look microscopically at the contents of these uh, scats and compare it to uh, plant reference materials and identify what, was, what they were eating. So some, you know, the, the main thing that came out of this is that they were eating willow leaves, which is very reaffirming to our observations from the summer. So that's what the, the, the dark green and the light green are two different species of willows. Uh, the last part here is really the important one. This is the, the cumulative for all of the porcupines. These are the other bars are individual porcupines. Some other interesting things to point out um, that we found they're reading apples. We only really found one apple tree out there that's kind of a remnant from an old homestead, and we found an apple with some porcupine chewing on it. They were also eating wild cucumber, um, also known as man root, and this is what the fruits look like, which was really interesting, at least to me. I had hadn't really expected that. Uh, and then various other, you know, native herbaceous things and bark. Uh, we did collect winter scats and um, we'll be doing analysis on that. So it'll be really interesting to see how their winter diet changed. Okay. Uh, Tim mentioned, you know, the reproductive cycle and I just wanted to share some pictures of 
observations. Again, we haven't, we don't know a lot about how that's different here um, or whether it is. We saw several babies in the summer, um, really only a couple times with them with the mother, and this is from a trail camera, so um, the picture. Uh, this was this picture was taken just two weeks ago. Um, my assistant John and I came across this baby porcupine out in the dunes. Uh, it seems like an unusual sight in late January, um, but again, we don't really know how old these animals are. And then this guy was probably back in December, so they are reproducing out there. Uh, I mentioned earlier we uh, about a porcupine using a burrow, and that was a really interesting thing that we found this summer. Um, just kind of anecdotally, we would find them. You know, you track down the signal and then you spend the next half hour trying to find where the porcupine actually is, you know, in your immediate vicinity. And often they would be underground or under down logs or under like an overhanging um, thing. And, you know, some of these, we're not sure if the porcupines themselves are digging these holes, but they're definitely using these structures. And so, you know, thinking about the, um, the existence of these types of this type of structural diversity out there is maybe being really important for porcupines um, in providing shelter. This is a yeah, this mm -hmm. hole. Uh, another structure we found them using was an old beaver lodge. So in the Yontucket Slough area, uh, which was dry all summer, we were able to find an old beaver lodge. We put up a trail camera. Um, we found a porcu several porcupines actually coming in and out of the beaver lodge, mm -hmm. as well as, probably can't see this very well, but this is a mink mm -hmm. and a long-tailed weasel. Uh, we found some possum, several other rodents using the same structure. So that was a mink? A mink. Is that wild or is that feral? It's wild. Yeah, they're native. They're native. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have several natives. Uh, I can turn back over to Tim. You can take that first one. I can take the, the first school, and our future plans is for me to finish my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there, Tim. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you for your attention. So this is right the first year of hopefully a multi-year study. Um, porcupines are not listed as threatened or endangered. There's not a lot of um, clear funding sources for them. So it's really great news to hear that this is going to continue to fund this. Not just for my own benefit, but um, it's been great. We've had a ton of undergrads come out and get to see these porcupines and how they work in the dunes. And, um, it's rare to have a mammal that doesn't just immediately run away that's trying to find it. And so to have that opportunity for humble State students is great. Um, we've also got uh, another master's student in my lab and her lucky dog, Hank, are um, training on porcupine scat scent. So Hank may become a detection dog for porcupine scent as a potentially non-invasive uh, method. Where is Sharon? Let's see. Oh. <laughs> Sharon's over there. Um, as a potential way, we ran into, or I hear that we ran into kind of an interesting obstacle a couple of weeks ago where um, Hank had been testing or had been trained on these um, summer scats and scats from Dorsey too. And then I guess you went out this, you want to tell the story, Sharon? Yeah, no, um, so I think it looks like they're, they're definitely eating something different in the wintertime. It's going to be, uh, we've been testing it on, as Tim said, summer scat that was collected in the summertime. And he didn't immediately indicate, he lays down when he finds scat, he didn't immediately indicate on any of the winter scat. So we're thinking that he might be a little bit confused and that it might smell so different that it's confusing. Now it's a back to training with more Yeah, so this is like a common issue, I guess, with training detection dogs, is you want as many different kinds of animal poop as possible to train them on so they know the range of smells. And I guess, apparently, right, winter and summer porcupine diet is so different that he wasn't really even sure if it was porcupine. Um, but this gets back to, I want to get back to the original question, which is what's happening with porcupines in California? And um, I'll lay out a couple of ideas. One is this Yoakum idea that um, as trees are growing back in, as we get more second growth forests, there's just less food and less habitat available for porcupines. And that's kind of more of a natural decline back to the earlier densities that um, were more quote unquote natural 
Um, predation is another possible explanation. Mountain lion populations are certainly increasing, and locally, fisher populations seem to be doing pretty well. Um, so that may be having an influence on populations of porcupines, at least locally. Um, it can't talk about this area without talking about illegal cannabis trespass grows and the amazing amounts of rodenticide that are being put in our environment. Um, and porcupines are rodents. And so it would stand to reason that um, having access to lots of rodenticide may be causing issues for porcupines. Um, those are the three, I think. We really don't know. And so um, this was kind of a first effort to better understand porcupine natural history in this area, get the skills that we need to know how to study these things, and then hopefully expand into other areas to try to start answering this for a more important question about what's going on. So um, with that, I'm going to thank a ton of people, including all of the undergraduates who have volunteered on this project and were interns over the summer, um, Kara's uh, graduate thesis committee, many people in the community who have done all kinds of different things to help support this project, um, whether financial or otherwise logistical, including some funding for the Sequoia Park too. So, and thank you for your attention, and we will gladly take questions. <laughs>
I mean, muskrats or coyotes, coyotes might be digging. Um, or the work uh, yeah, for yeah. months. They could be. But it's pretty intense. I mean, some of these burrows have like hundreds of old scats around them. Yeah. So it's clearly they're using them for a really long time and clearly they know where they are okay. within their home. So they're like coming back. Yeah. 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 How old? Did, sure, go ahead. Uh, how old do they uh, live to be on average? Do, I, maybe in yeah, general. I mean, I know you probably don't. What was that? 10 to 20 years 10 to 20. in the wild, is what I've read. Yeah. Yeah. How do you capture them? Uh, very carefully. Um, <laughs> with the, uh, the short answer is with the trash can. Um, basically, we're just kind of wandering around. And um, the nice thing about this system is that there aren't a ton of tall trees that they're going up to the top of and feeding for two weeks at the top of that. They're spending a lot of time on the ground and wandering from willow patch to willow patch. So it's kind of opportunistically. So you just slam them. Or kind of put it in front of them and encourage them to go in. <laughs> there's kind of this instinct that's like, if you're harassing them from all sides and there's a dark place that they can go into, it's sort of just, yeah, it's like a burrow for them. Like, this is better than whatever's going on outside. Or you, you, don't, you don't use half a heart traps or We tried and it was not successful. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. So those of us who remember seeing porcupines regularly around here, I remember that there were certain what I would call hot spots where we would, you know, every time we went to that location, we'd see a porcupine, or every time you brought your dog, they came back and kill. So, does with your porcupinder.com site, are you also looking for those of us who lived here? A while ago, remember those Absolutely. hot spots? Yeah, there's, um, you know, there's a place where you can put in a date, and if you don't remember a specific date, or if it was multiple times, you can put in the comments and say, okay. you know, um, was it, you know, Centerville Beach Road, going up to Centerville Beach, that's the one that used to be a pretty big hot spot, but we in there anyway. Yeah. Is there a long tradition of the native people using the quills, or so it's been a steady population for them? Well, it's hard to say. Um, and I've talked with people who do traditional ecological research and knowledge research, and um, you know, they say that there's such extensive trading between tribes that it's really hard to know whether there were porcupines native or if quills were just universally recognized as like a perfect material for a lot of um, crafts. There is one um, archaeological site from down in Mendocino that had some porcupine remains in it. I don't remember that yeah. correctly. Um, so at least at one site down south, you know, a thousand years ago or so, there was at least one part of it. The other thing is, so the, the Yoakum paper where he had all the reports and said that there weren't porcupines here until the, you know, the timber industry, he also had reports from as early as 1900s. So, I mean, his claim was really about the density of porcupines. I think, you know, even his data shows that there were a couple of porcupines at least. They're really hard to see. If they're not on the ground, if they're like up in a spruce, I mean, it's all covered in lichens, right? And their quills and guard hairs, you saw, are super yellow, and they just blend in perfectly. So they're harder to detect, I think, than we think that they are. And if they're not damaging bark extensively like they are in other places, they may be present, we just don't really realize it. Yeah? It, so if, if the weather's nice, so will they stay up in a tree day, day after day? They don't They don't necessarily go to a den every night? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't, the den stuff was, there was like one that was really into the den, <laughs> even in the summer. Um, but most of them were just kind of out and about in the summer until it started raining. That's when we started discovering all of these like cool hiding places that they had, not just in the dunes, but um, down logs and things like that. If there are no more questions, I'll say thank you.